What is the good life? How do we attain it, achieve it, and retain it? Does adopting the good life make us good, or do we have to be good to achieve it? And what is its actual value if it is not recognized, respected, cherished, and encouraged? And that to have value, it must have a consequential and rightful future. For that which is good morally and practically must be cultivated, nurtured, and venerated. The good life must be visible, understood, and aspired to, your life as an example to others, to be good. In the West of the twentieth century, the good life became synonymous with material plenty. The enjoyment and pleasure gained from suburban affluence was esteemed as never before. The iconography of advertising is testament to the glowing vision of a bounteous and exuberant optimism, a world of leisure and pleasure, a world without end. As Western man was stripped of his moral and religious certainties in the wake of World War II, he was offered up this material manifestation of goodness, a life made good in consumption and pleasure. For all that Western kind valued in the kingdom of Christ, here was a ready-made version of his reward, the good life rewarded by a conspicuous plenty. But you cannot purchase virtue, you cannot gain morality as a commodity. For as easily as this shining ideal was constructed, it could be collapsed. Its foundations were not in the moral hearts of man, but merely written in the ledger of the lone company. The desire to be good, and be seen to be good, remains in the hearts of our people. But this performance of virtue was and is only that which we are permitted, the success of marketing over morality and will. And even this meretricious vision is now dimmed, it is too exploitative, too exclusive, too white. For to be good in life and enjoy a good life now is no longer within the purview of Western man. His goodness is only in his self-debasement and in a suicidal retreat. No life at all. The vision sold was one merely loaned at interest and is now being repossessed.